So, peeps, our next speakers, Fernando Spina and Lissandro Loria, over here, are to, you know, to show us uh, something about Godot 4. Right, Godot 4 got a lot of love. Godot 4.1 got a lot of love again. And Godot 4.2, even more so. And uh, it's a lot that it can do. Now, Lissandro and Fernando are going to show us just how good it can look. Because they tried for two months. <laughs> All right. So, peeps, welcome them to the stage. Okay, there's so many people. I, I wasn't expecting that many people. Um, so I'm extremely nervous right now. Uh, okay, so uh, Fernando Lisandro, and we have Fer here. We call him Fer GPT because he's in Argentina. Here? Okay. Uh, so he's listening uh, via YouTube, and if you have any questions for him, he can respond. So. Uh, there we go. Um, it, we are a very small team uh, in W4. I don't know if, w if you know W4, but uh, it was founded by some of the creators of Godot and some other people uh, that you might know. And we are part of what we call the demo team. We, we, use, um, we create small demos, uh, prototypes, usually in two months, three months, not, not more than that. Um, and well, we have Lisandro here programming, Fernando here uh, doing the art, and me as a game designer and a project manager. So I'm the only one less technical. So my whole <laughs> my whole thing is uh, asking for them to do things and then telling them there's no more time to do it. Uh, so <laughs> uh, move it. Um, okay, so yeah, what we do is uh, actually we create games and we intend to release those games for free open source so you guys can play it, check them, learn from them. And every game we do is to actually um, showcase some of the things that we're doing in W4 as private products. So um, just to give you an idea of what we've been doing lately, uh, this is Planet Crushers, and this is what we have been doing for the last, I don't know, uh, three, three months, yeah, four? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so we had two, two months to do this, and this is where we come from. Just to give you an idea of what you're about to see, uh, the 3D demo that you're about to see was made by people who two months prior were doing pixel art. Uh, so, uh, I don't know how many of you are programmers. In Garakan, yeah. Uh, how many of you are artists or consider yourself artists? Well, yeah, okay. So uh, the idea is that we had a 3D artist who has never, he was really good at Blender, but he had never uh, done Godot uh, or worked with the Godot float. Uh, and he was doing pixel art and hyper casual games. And suddenly, uh, some of our bosses told, told us, we need something really great visually. You have two months. Uh, go. <laughs> so uh, we or he had to learn a lot uh, really quickly. So that didn't give me, for example, a chance as a game designer to actually ask for many things. Uh, we have some ideas of what we want to do with that scene. Because we started doing something completely different, sci-fi and with shooting. And then Juan came and said, use this castle. It's going to be really easy. And it wasn't. <laughs> so we're working now with a huge scene in Blender. And it was kind of like a headache. But the good thing about the headache is that we learned so much trying to do that, particularly the workflow from working with something that exists in Blender and then putting them in Godot and working. So <clears throat> uh, Planet Crashers is uh, today we are releasing it. So if you want to download it, yeah. <laughs> it's there. Uh, nobody knows about this, so you got the uh, you got the the premiere of our little, very little game. Uh, no, okay. Oh, of course it's going to happen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Of course, it was going to happen. OK, so you can download it after the call. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the proper link. OK, so 
um, okay, so what did we do with uh, our our current project? Um, it's called Legend of the Nuku Warriors because we wanted a Japanese name, um, and it, well, it looked like that. And we did it in two months. <coughs> we didn't have much idea of what gameplay it was going to have at first. But as we ran out of time, we didn't run out of options. So <coughs> uh, we are going to be doing with this scene uh, and these characters uh, something of a JRPG, very simple, because we have two more months to complete it. So that's the, the main idea, the main idea of what we intend to do. Uh, Lisandro here is going to show you actually how we move this, the scene from Blender to the, and all the problems that we had. <clears throat> That's pretty much uh, the idea and the context of what you're going to see. So if you've never worked in 3D and you want to give it a try, in two months you can be doing this, provided you have the proper help. <laughs> but, um, we also intend to release more documentation about what, everything what we have learned here uh, in the next month. Yeah, so. Okay, so basically, um this is basically the demo so far it's mostly you have a um, an fps controller we, we got that from from the asset store uh, okay. No, right okay okay it's fine it's fine <laughs> awesome <laughs> Okay, so uh, basically you have um, an FPS uh, character controller. We, we got that from the SS store. We you have a, also a free floating camera to to look around and, and see behind behind the scenes everything that's not <laughs> finished yet. Um, and yeah, it has a couple of, of features that we wanted to to try. For example, uh, it's using uh, Dario Samo implemented for 4.2 4 uh, AMD FSR uh, 2.2 upscaling, and that is one of the options. You, if you if you when you have access to to the emulator, you will be able to just like toggle it and see how how good it looks. Like you can run the game at a water of the resolution, and it still looks uh, really really cool. Um, we also added like a day-night transition. We we are using Clayton's uh, volumetric uh, clouds. Um, basically, yeah, you have a slider where you can control like uh, the time of the day, and it will affect things like uh, the the water will rise, uh, like like the tides. Uh, you also have a fog that appears at night that disappears uh, during the day. Um, yeah, I'm not, not going to go much longer into this because, we, because we're going to talk about uh, the technical details uh, just a bit. But but yeah, this demo will be uh, available for, for you. It's going to be um, mid-license, uh, everything except some professional assets that we, we got. I'm going to talk a bit later about it. So those are going to be like uh, Creative Commons, non-commercial, and if you want, you can, you can get a license. But everything else, what we did at W4, that's going to be uh, mid-license. License, so you will be able to to get this and <laughs> do whatever you want. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. It's not over. Um, <laughs> what else We're are you going to show? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So um, let's go a bit more into some some technical details. Uh, no. I have to use the editor sometimes. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so one of the problems that we we had we had the, this from a previous uh, most of the the environment from a previous uh, abandoned project. Um, so that that's also saved us a lot of time to do it in in two months. It also helps to to have uh, two very senior members of the Godot rendering team also working at W4. <laughs> so that's uh, just a bit of help, right? Uh, but yeah, one of the problems that that we had is uh, duplicated meshes. 
So uh, we had uh, this, this big scene that we are exporting as a single uh, GLTF file. And what happens is if you see, for example, those columns, uh, those columns are all exactly the same, but they have modifiers. So they are linked duplicates. They sh like Blender knows they are the same thing with the same modifiers, with the same parameters. But currently, the GLTF um, exporter is, is not being able to, to be aware of that and say, oh, OK, when I apply the modifiers, I'm going to get exactly the same mesh every time. So it doesn't really make sense to export like a thousand columns with a thousand duplicated meshes. Just reuse that one. So that doesn't happen. We get tons of meshes, and that results in uh, more memory when we run the game, and also a lot more draw calls, because that cannot be patched, because the engine thinks they are different things. So it's usually the way it's usually solved is you export, uh, you have the 3D artist export everything as, a, as, a, as tiny chunks, uh, and then you kind of rebuild everything uh, inside the engine. and. I know this, this workflow works if you're at a, at a big company or if you need a lot, if you have a level designer that has nothing to do with the actual uh, 3D artist. But in our workflow, uh, for two people, we wanted to, to have it be uh, very uh, Blender centric. I wanted uh, Fernando to work on the tool that he likes and that he's comfortable with. And at the same time, I wanted the integration process to be as uh, automatic as possible. I don't want to have to manually check, uh, delete stuff, and then duplicate it in Godot or, or toggle checkboxes. So uh, we tried to find a way to uh, deduplicate this in the editor. So the first uh, approach, because I, I thought, OK, if we compare the data, um, it's going to be really slow. Like if I have 2,000 meshes and I have to compare all the data against the other 2,000 meshes, that, that's going to make the import take like an hour, <laughs> right? So I said, OK, well, uh, fair, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make one thing. You just uh, make everything that needs to be duplicated have exactly the same name uh, and add a hyphen ddub. So it's just like Godot has this uh, hyphen call that creates collision. OK, let's add our own, add hyphen ddub. And it should be the same name except the the final uh, number suffix. So when I see that, I'm going to assume it has the same mesh, and I'm going to duplicate it. And that seemed to work, but he has some problems. So it is completely manual. So Fer had to go and rename everything to add that little uh, uh, DDub. Uh, even if you can uh, kind of automate it, uh, he didn't know how, how, so he had to rename everything. And it's really easy to make a tiny mistake. You can have a typo and uh, things don't get deduplicated, or even worse, which is, for example, here. Um, so here, as you can see, if I see this as the programmer, I see nothing wrong with it. This is a uh, vitro, and and there is some empty space. So I thought that, that w it was meant to look like that. But then I look at the Blender file, and this blue thing here is another mesh. and so that was supposed to exist somewhere. So why is not uh, there in the game? And it's basically because they had the same name with the DDUP, so it got duplicated. They got the first one and say, OK, this one is the second one. Because the script doesn't know about the actual mesh contents. It just checks the naming scheme. So uh, it needed to look actually like the image on, on the right. So we tried a different approach. So I said, OK, I'm going to have to somehow consider the actual uh, data. Uh, but how, how can we do it in a somewhat performant way? So my first idea was, OK, I can use mesh.getFaces. And that will basically give me a, a packed vector3 array of all the vertex content uh, in that mesh. I can hash that. And if the hashes match, it's supposed to be the same same mesh. So I make like a, a dictionary, and I use that hash as a key. And then when I get one mesh that is not there yet, I put it I put it in the dictionary. If I see another one that hash to the same value, I drop it and reuse the one that I've already seen. And if not, I add it to the dictionary. So it's just one iteration. By the time we are done, uh, we have everything duplicated, and that. I thought it would have been it would be 
kind of slow, but it took six seconds on this uh, laptop to duplicate uh, more than 2,000 meshes. So it's it's only one thing that happens when you import. So if you drop the GLTF file, it already takes a long time because it has to load more than just uh, running that script. So those six uh, seconds don't matter um, that much. And it got us a 20% reduction in, in draw calls. So that, that was really cool, help with, uh, with performance, especially because we didn't have time to go and optimize all the geometry and make sure that everything ran well. But then uh, talking to Clayton, uh, I, he mentioned, like, like I said, like, am I sure they are the same mesh because they have the same vertex data? And he said, like, well, it could be be the same mesh in terms of vertex data, but maybe the UVs are, are different, or, or like the, there are more things that, that can make a mesh different than just the, the actual vertices. So, uh, so yesterday, basically, <laughs> or the day before, I, um, I tried to make it even better, and instead of using uh, get faces, I basically get all the arrays from all the surfaces, so get all that together, hash that, and uh, use that, which is much more accurate because it can detect two meshes that only differ in UVs or tangents or vertex colors. So, so it handles edge cases, edge cases much better. And it turns out that it's also 20% faster than, than the other approach. And one nice thing about Godot being open source is that I can go see the source, see how uh, get faces works, and see, oh yeah, of course, this is going to take more time because it has to produce data that we don't have, while well, this approach uh, uses data that is already uh, generated. So yeah, that, that helped us uh, a lot uh, to get the, the, the project running at, at 60 uh, FPS, uh, even though we have a lot more to, to do. So another thing that uh, we didn't get to use it in the, in the demo, because we finished it uh, very late in the production, but I think it might be useful for a lot of people is, you know how uh, when you import from uh, Blender into Godot, you have those um, these uh, import hints like uh, hyphen call that will generate collisions automatically, hyphen convex call, uh, call only if you only wanted to use that mesh as a collider. And uh, yeah, same thing. If you have someone um, doing, if you have a specific person that's going to take care of integration, maybe they can build that in, in Godot. But if you can have that as just like a tiny thing that you add to the name and it creates everything for you, uh, for a small team, it's really useful. So what, what I thought is, okay, but can we do more? Like, what if we want to automate more stuff? Uh, because uh, we cannot add everything to, to the name. Like, we, you cannot have uh, a database inside the name of a, <laughs> of a mesh node in, in, in Blender. It, it doesn't scale well. But B Blender has this nice thing called custom properties, which is basically just a, a, a key value store. So you can uh, give your property a name and then choose, OK, what's it going to be? So it's going to be a string, uh, integer, so whatever you want. And when you export this, to uh, GLTF, the way it's handled is they get converted to a JSON object. So that that's the this is part of the uh, GLTF uh, schema. So um, every, every time you have custom properties in Blender, you you get this in your uh, GLTF JSON file. Um, and the thing is, uh, Godot also has something that's very similar. Godot in object, in the object class, you have set meta and get meta. And you can actually, without needing to add a script, without needing to add uh, exported variables, you can add metadata to uh, anything. Like, it could be to a node, it could be to a resource. So it could be to our meshes, to our mesh instances, to our materials, our cameras, or, or lights. So if we need that, we, we can do it. The problem is that as, the, as it works right now, the good old GLTF, um, GLTF importer is uh, reading that, um, that, may, that, that extras JSON, but not doing much with it. It's only caring about, about something regarding uh, blend shapes, and it's ignoring the rest. So I try to find a way to make it work. And the way it works is in uh, two stages. So 
Uh, the first stage is writing um, uh, GLDF document extension. So uh, th that, that happens when uh, the file is imported. Uh, we have access to everything. We have access to the resulting Godot scene, and we also have access to the, the JSON data. And at that point, uh, we can like intercept that importing process and say, okay, let's add all those all those um, extra properties. Let's convert it into metadata. The only problem we had is is that in a, it works almost for everything, but it doesn't work for mesh instances, which were probably the the uh, largest use case, because those are, in, are created as importer mesh instance first, and then there is like a built-in uh, document extension that will convert, uh, convert it at, and at the point where we have access to this, we don't have access to the final meshes. So what, what I had to do is basically, okay, I add a sibling node with that metadata, it's just like a placeholder node for that metadata, and then at later stage with a, with a post import script, we basically I, I say okay, whatever I find the node, it has the metadata. Okay, the previous one, the, the previous sibling is the one that I care about. I have to merge that uh, back in, and that's how we get um, how we get metadata in in everything. And what do you do with that? Well, you, you can do uh, whatever you want. And as I said, if you have, for example, a walking simulator where uh, it's more about the art style, that 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 careful placement of uh, everything in terms of a gameplay. Like it's not an FPS where you have someone that that's really worried about if a column is like 10 millimeters here or there in terms of gameplay. In in other games, it's more about does it look good. So it's really important that the 3D artist has full context of what he can what he can see. So you can do whatever. You can say, okay, uh, this wall should be destroyed in. Uh, five hits. You can add that as a as a custom property, and then in a, in the post import script, you can make it uh, automatically convert that into your uh, prepared scene with all the logic, and then just add the mesh. And it, you don't have to have a person doing that uh, manually, right? So. Um, those uh, for, for those, uh, and there are people asking for like um, creating proposals for what I've just implemented here, like the deduplication and the extra properties. Those are actually open proposals. So there are users that want this uh, in Godot. So it is it is working now, at least in in GScript. So if it makes sense to to somewhat having as a as a, a feature or an optional feature in Godot, well. We'll see, but at least it ca it can be done. It, it, there is a a way to do it. Um, how much time do we have left? Okay, so um, adding water to the mix. So we wanted to have a nice, uh, really nice uh, ocean, uh, but I don't know that much about uh, shader programming, as Fer mentioned. We were doing uh, pixel art games like uh, two months before. <laughs> Um, so, in, in case you don't know, there is this is really cool page go, called GodotShaders.com, and it has tons of, of really cool stuff. So we found one that that looked uh, pretty interesting. Um, it's a water shaded by a user uh, called uh, Union Bytes, but it was for Godot three, and it, it was kind of in the process of porting to to Godot four. So I, I took that. And there were some issues with uh, some buildings. Um, I don't know if I have it. Um, let's see if I have it here. Yeah, there are some issues with, for example, yeah. no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, like model matrix, um, model view matrix. So th those uh, built-ins changed names, and it was mostly fixing uh, fixing that to make it look um, good. Let me see if I can open the scene that I want. Yeah. And that mostly fixed some 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 um some issues when you move the camera that the, the water would not look good. It will kind of jitter around. Um but yeah the other thing that I wanted to fix is uh I'll show it in the demo, it's much easier. So another thing that I wanted to to fix is, let's see. 
So if you, if I'm gonna need you to, to help me just a bit. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So as, as you can see, when the water meets the shore, uh, it has this, um, this nice, smooth transition. So in the original shader, this was uh, um, basically a clear cut between water and, uh, and the shore. And it looked kind of retro uh, for, for how otherwise uh, pretty good looking and, and photorealistic the, the shader is. Uh, that transition didn't, didn't look uh, good at all. So to, to make that and, and also to make the, basically, to make the water in the horizon also uh, smoothly disappear instead of being a clear cut where you see, oh, this is a mesh that doesn't go uh, infinitely far. So uh, to fix those two things, um, I noticed that, okay, well, I don't know that much about shaders to do it myself, but I know that uh, Godot has uh, a standard material. Um, and the standard material already has that uh, functionality. So if you, if you open, um, if you create a standard material, you already have the proximity fade that you can just enable, and you have the distance fade, again, that you can just uh, enable. And this is the same uh, trick that uh, Janus mentioned in his uh, talk. So basically, you just go here and convert it to a shader material. And you can check the shader. And basically, again, you can steal the hard work of all the <laughs> kind of contributors and say, oh, OK, where is that? Oh, here, proximity fade, distance fade. OK, I'll copy this. It will complain that those uniforms are missing. So where are they? OK, here. And it's basically just, I just moved that into the water shader and it worked. Uh, so that's for the water. <laughs> Thank you. The other thing that we wanted to make work well, again, this is if you if you um, if you were at, at Yenstock, this is basically the same approach. Uh, sorry for the <laughs> overlapping content. So basically, we had a, a terrain, and we wanted to have a smooth transitions between uh, different materials. And Fair had already solved that in uh, Blender. Um, by creating basically a, a visual uh, shader that did that. It's basically you have a set of uh, like three albedos, three normal maps, or, or, or in our case it was a, an ORM, it was a, a combined uh, texture. And it's pretty simple. You paint the vertex colors, and the red channel will be one of those texture sets. The green channel will be another, and the blue channel will be another. And you just, depending on the uh, how high those channels are, so how much red, how much green, how much blue you have, that's basically how much you're going to mix them together. It's just like a couple of mix operations. So that was pretty straightforward. So it was mostly. Um, I think I have the code here. So that was pretty simple to uh, recreate the shader because it didn't import automatically. So um, Godot doesn't really know how uh, shaders work in, in Blender. Like they, they do, they work in a different way. It's not like a one-to-one. -one. Like you make a shader in Blender and and automatically you have that uh, as a visual shader in, in Godot. I wish, I wish we had. <laughs> if someone <laughs> is smart enough to to do that, it would be awesome. Um, so in this case, it was as as simpler as again creating a nowhere material, converting it to shader, and then just adding this function to, to do the mixing. And, and that's it. So that's how we got, the, um, how we got those, those uh, smooth terrain transitions, like between rock and grass here, or uh, rock and sand, or different types of, uh, of rock. And... Yeah, another thing that we wanted to have is we wanted to, uh, since we had um, a short amount of time, 
we wanted to avoid having to uh, create all the content. If we could use professional assets, that would be awesome. I mean, we, we, we tried with uh, open source assets, but, but creating nice looking 3D assets uh, is something really valuable. So if you're really good at create, creating 3D assets, you're usually uh, doing that uh, as your day job and you're uh, charging for it. So it's, it's hard to, to, like, there are nice looking open source assets, but usually it's very limited. And we found a lot of, like, low poly, very stylized stuff that was cool. Uh, but we were doing something that was more, a bit more intermediate, a bit more, more towards uh, photorealism, not fully photorealistic, but a bit towards that. Um, so what what um, we did is is try to negotiate with with some of these uh, companies to be able to use some of their assets, and of course that's also hard because. Um, it's really hard to relicense something. I mean, if you have that revenue stream from that those nice looking trees or, or whatever, it's it's really hard to say. Okay, I wanna pay uh, pay a fixed price for a license, and people are gonna be able to. I, I mean, I, you, I want that like mid license. So uh, your tree that's getting you a nice amount of money every month. So suddenly everyone can download and use that for free commercially. So uh, it's really hard to to like how much are you are you gonna charge, right? So what, but what we found as a really nice compromise, uh, and, and that was when, when the nature manufacturer guys uh, approaches us, is okay. We can do that as uh, Creative Commons non-commercial. So say if if we do that licensing for our assets, uh, we can give you access to much more uh, stuff, and you can show it in demo. Uh, it works for us because if the people see it in demo and they like it, uh, they can also get a license and that's it so that's what I mentioned earlier other than for example in this case uh, we only got to uh, we got this done also late in the development process so we only got to add the trees but the idea is to add more uh, more of their stuff and again if you if you like that you can you can contact them everything else that you see in the demo uh, will basically be fully open source mid license for whatever purpose and also the way those uh, are uh, integrated into the the engine is with the amazing uh, proton scatter plugin. Have, uh, who has heard of proton scatter here? Okay, so so quite a few. So yeah, I have never used it. It was like so easy to to basically download it, uh, inst make it work, uh, easy to learn. So so I, I love <laughs> Proton Scatter right now, and and it's also so, so performance. So, so these trees. Uh, they're not, not using uh, multi meshes because I had some some issues with uh, Alpha. They are actually using uh, copies. Even though they're using copies, uh, we get stable uh, frame rates. That was also thanks to a lot of uh, optimizations on the rendering side of, of things. But but it's awesome that it's so simple. Like you, you create some uh, some volumes here, some some spheres, and you tell you, okay, just populate this with with trees, snap them to the collider, and and, and that's it. So it, it's a re uh, easy way to have like thousands of uh, of ob objects create a forest or, or whatever you want. Um, so, okay, so um, what worked, what didn't, and what uh, can we improve? Uh, so mesh duplication, I think it worked uh, pretty well. Um, it, it gave us a nice performance boost. Uh, in, in the end, it didn't it didn't have errors. So, so when we had the final version, I think it, it was a, a net positive in the project. It saved us a lot of of time. Um, as I said, as I originally mentioned, uh, Proton Scatter too. It was super easy to use, uh, super easy to, to set up, <laughs> great performance. Uh, so for something that was I like a few days before Godocon, uh, I was super nervous that it would make everything break, and now worked perfectly fine. Uh, again, the we were also worried. Okay, those assets from Nature Manufacture, they do. They, they I think they work with uh, Unreal before um, Unreal. Or, or Unity. Well, they, they were very focused on like uh, the 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 um, photorealistic style, and we were worried because ours was kind of stylized. So are they gonna integrate well? But yeah, at least for the ones uh, we tried, they integrated pretty well. So that was also um, 
something that, that, that were fine. Uh, what didn't work as well is, well, I uh, during those two months, on top of having a uh, little time and not knowing that much about uh, about this level of uh, 3D art, uh, w I was also working with uh, dev builds from uh, Godot 4.2. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have used uh, Godot 4.2, like dev one, dev two, it's like you get all the all the bugs. It also means that we got to fix uh, a couple of really uh, nasty bugs. So at least we, we got to give back to the community by reporting those bugs. And they are already uh, fixed in, in, I think it's the uh, four or five by now. So I had to suffer with that so that you didn't have to. <laughs> <clears throat> And well, something that didn't, you may have not noticed it, but it didn't work that well is the day to night transition. So there is, uh, the night is completely fake. It's basically the same uh, cloud shader uh, that's meant for, for, uh, day, day sky, uh, for daytime. And it's basically, we just use a sun that it, it's kind of blue tinted and very dim. It kind of looks like, like the moon is, is going around. But also, when you then want it to, to make it rise as a, as a sun, you have to like quickly rotate everything. It, it doesn't work that well, but it's pretty easy to just add uh, basically the the transition with the, the starry night and then blend between like the two the two functions: the one that will create the the, the nice uh, daytime clouds and and add the the stars. That's one of the things we. We like to improve for uh, for GDC, which will be the other milestone for for this project. Uh, one thing I couldn't get working correctly um, is uh, having nice reflections in the water. So having the, the all the buildings and terrain nicely reflect in the water. I I'm still looking into it. I'm not sure if it is something that I don't really know how to do or if it is a, a, a bug in in, in 4.2. So still looking into it. Uh, we hope to to hopefully we'll get it uh, working for. Uh, the next milestone. And, and yeah, as I said before, there's a lot of room for optimization in the 3D environment, both in, in like optimizing the geometry, using more uh, trim sheets, um, whatever. There, there's a lot of uh, room for improvement uh, right there. I also have to talk to, talk to, to Clay about some uh, optimizations. So we hope to, to get it looking even better for the next release and also running even, even faster. And also, as Fer mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, uh, this is so far. It's just like okay, you can walk around. It's uh, interactive, sort of. Uh, you have sliders and, and buttons, but not much uh, gameplay. So the idea is to make it like a very simple uh, JRPG. I know that I say JRPG and and simple and. It <laughs> uh, but but we we love the, the challenge, so. Um, yeah, it's it's basically gonna be you walk around and then you you encounter an enemy and you go to a battle like a classic Final Fantasy style battle battle scene with all the enemies in a row and they attack in in turns and we're gonna have like two attacks per character that I'm sure they're gonna be one by the time we have to <laughs> release this. <laughs> um, yeah, we we also want, of, of course, we also want to have uh, character animations and everything. So so we'll see. We we always uh, like you know you you have this uh, nice little scope, and a couple of weeks later is a huge game. You know, the, like what happened? Well, because I had this idea that might look cool and it didn't seem that difficult, and and then you add and you add and you add. And, well, it, it the thing that was simple turned out to be really hard. So and now we have the thing that was actually really hard. Well, we'll see, we'll see, but. But yeah, we, we want to, to make this something that's also uh, somewhat playable. Yeah. Let's try again. Remember to log into Itch.io. <laughs> I just fixed it. It should work. By the way, in the meantime, in the meantime, oh. yeah. uh, I think we have some time for Q and A. So, if anyone has questions, yeah, we also have the three D artist on Discord. So, uh, if you have some questions for for him, hopefully he will type really fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, hello. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, as well as Itch, are you also planning on releasing your demo projects to, say, like Steam or other stores, and also updating them with like uh, new content going on, like more levels and more enemies and things like this? Or is it kind of a case of it's released and then you're on to the next thing, I guess? Um, there are some uh, improvements that we plan to do. Uh, there's there, there's some some content that's already ready in terms of having the visual assets, uh, but we didn't get to to have it uh, in time in the game. Uh, and there's probably some improvements that can be done to to the code. It, it is a prototype, so the code is meant to be uh, the way it was approached is that it should be really simple. If if I want to to throw away some Something because the the game design document changed a lot. It should be really easy. So that means you don't have really nice structures. You have everything is really like loosely integrated. Um, so I don't know. We could do some changes now that we are more sure about how the game uh, works in terms of uh, gameplay. But this is mostly the idea is that you can tinker with it. So it's not so much as uh, W4 is a game developer. We're much approaching it as uh, we are publishing games for people to to buy and play them um, it's more like uh, this is how you can uh, create something in, in Godot in the case of uh, Planet Crashers uh, it's mostly a demo of how to use uh, W4 Cloud which is our multiplayer uh, solution uh, but of course you, you you could also use it with like the the networking stuff is Godot networking Um, thank you for, for the presentation. I really uh, like the, the prototype. It looks really nice. Um, I wanted to ask, um, can we find, like, the? you said you will like post some of the, the progress you had with the project uh, online. Can we find that somewhere, like, um, or is that like a plan you have? You mean the 3D demo? Uh, yeah, for example, or do you plan, like, uh, on releasing, like, a blog or something like that where we can, like, I don't know, read up on your, like, Basically, the journey you had there. So, um, oh, um, it's a great idea. <laughs> we, I mean, we we don't have it uh, right now, but yeah, it's a, it, it's probably gonna happen. I mean, we 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 publish a blog post from time to time. So, yeah, of course, if there is interest to to have this uh, summed up in, in writing. Yeah, of course, of course, it, we, we, we can do it. I, I have committed to it already, so I, I'll have to do it some, somewhere. Um, so uh, I really enjoyed doing games in 3D with Godot, but uh, what, 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 what could, would you say to maybe a 2D game developer in, that uses Godot but is maybe scared to go in 3D? So what is your impression going from 2D to 3D in Godot? Well, that, that was mostly, I mean, when we started doing this uh, demo, the main objective was, OK, we need something good looking to say, OK, Godot can do 3D. Yeah, because, you know, everyone says Godot cannot do 3D. Uh, but then the whole uh, Unity thing happened, and very experienced people started creating uh, very good looking demos. So it wasn't, we couldn't do just that. Like, the w there are a lot of cool demos by now. So it was more like, OK, uh, it more, it's more about the journey. Like, I was not experienced in any of this. It was just two months. It was mostly reading the docs. And I think it is uh, easy enough. O of course, uh, first, uh, 3D art was really good looking from the start. So if you import good looking assets, uh, you already have a pretty nice start. But it's not really that hard. Uh, it's mostly like playing around with the million settings that Godot will give you and trying to find out uh, what looks good and what doesn't. So it's, it's more about trial and error. Of course, is if you have uh, knowledge of art and composition and, and color, uh, that helps uh, a lot. Uh, but it's not really something, that, oh, it's so hard to do a 3D in, in Godot. It, 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 if you start, you'll see it's not really that hard. Uh, hey, on your search for free high quality assets, did you encounter Polyheaven? Polyheaven? Um, because you can re reuse their assets in any kind of uh, form, you can resell and everything. No, Pablo, did we. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we didn't. Thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, I, I don't know. I I think we did we didn't. We, we might have maybe we didn't find uh, what we wanted. I don't know. I, I was focusing on like implementing everything, so I was not uh, in charge of actually finding the the assets. So uh, I don't know. Maybe we did. <laughs> no, we didn't. No, I just wanted to point out that we started doing something else, and as an advice from Juan Linetsky, he said, oh, I, I know that Fred did this castle, it should be really simple, don't worry. And um, so we started working on that castle before actually going to seek for other, other models. And the thing with Nature Manufacture came afterwards, uh, so we really didn't go and uh, search the web for more models. We we want we had a ton of models that Fur did, and then uh, the nature manufacturer thing happened, and we added just for this presentation just the trees. So uh, we didn't really look for anything. Yeah. Um, a question and a comment. Uh, the question um, you mentioned in the slides at some point. I'm not sure if you said it out loud. That vertex color importing is broken somehow. Has that been reported? Because I, I saw something in a talk yesterday as well uh, um, about the spaceship uh, scene. I think you ran into the exact same issue there. Yeah, <coughs> I was also at the talk yesterday, and, and yeah, Janus mentioned that, and I was like, oh no, because I didn't notice it. Uh, at least for our uh, terrain, that has like really smooth transitions, doesn't need any sharp uh, transitions, so it might be kind of kind of broken and not have the quality it needs to have but it's not really noticeable I compare the if I compare the blend file and the Godot file it looks correct so yeah that's one of the things that I want to check when I get back home if it is fixed in uh, 4.2 or if it is still not working but just not obvious in our demo also the comment uh, for the mesh deduplication it might be faster if you first check before you do any hashing the size of the mesh the number of vertices Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, there are there are a lot of uh, optimizations actually, uh, and also if you if you're really paranoid, you can also if you ever have a collision, you can also start checking uh, a couple more stuff and, and and be completely sure without having to validate everything, right? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm curious if you did any performance benchmarking or comparisons with other game engines starting with the letter U or so? Um, well, imagine that as hard as this with uh, for people with, with little experience to create this in two months, having to do it again in an engine that I don't use uh, and I've never used, uh, it would be uh, really hard. So um, maybe for that it would be nice if, I don't know, if, if we had someone already that already created a uh, demo in both in both engines and we can make a, a benchmark or we can compare, I don't know, like just grabbing the GLTF file and and bringing it into or the or the blend file, like exporting it for both engines and yeah, we could do a side-to-side -side, um, comparison, but no, no, we, we haven't uh, done it. I mean, what, we, what our focus is not exactly that Godot runs uh, like 1% better than any other engine, but that Godot runs runs good enough for all the people that are going to use it so if uh, that they can make nice looking uh, large scenes and it can run at a good performance so it's not so much about okay how how better are we because i mean uh, I, we know we're not gonna beat uh like if you have to make a giant city uh you know for example uh, yeah unreal uh, has a uh, lot more tech it's also much more difficult to use but of course, you will. You have Nanite. You have everything, and Godot has uh, has different objectives. So in our case, what we found out is that okay, it looks pretty good. Uh, we, we were happy with how, how it looks, and it was really easy to do. So that that's one thing that many Godot users uh, like that that usability, productivity. So that's uh, so it's how can we marry those two? How how can we keep Godot being? Uh, uh, an engine that makes you really productive, that works well with small teams where you can parallelize work as much as possible, and at the same time, how, we, how can we help uh, teams doing uh, more complex stuff still have performance, still have their, their workflow. So if, if you, I don't know if, you, if you've been to Clay's talk, so he, he talked a lot uh, about it. So that's more about the engine than our, our demo. 
in in the, in the first part when you talk about the about the 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 dopling getting the instances uh, you do talk uh, the, the, the word was like the duplication yes uh, when you make the hash you are taking into account some information about the materials i ask about because in in blender if you have a material uh, an object with multiple materials all the materials are binded to the mesh and not to the object so you can have uh, one column with multiple materials and you can have multi different columns with the one of the materials switched for blender this is not anymore an instance but if you hash only the geometry then inside godot they can be as, uh, the same instance of the mesh but with different materials but i don't really know if godot has some improvement or impact in this okay. because he, he can render different right yeah so um, yeah the question is basically uh when i do the, the duplication uh there is also one more edge case that yeah i <laughs> i actually consider that after doing the the last uh improvement and oh oh no we have one more edge case so yeah i think if you have ex if the mesh is exactly the same uh mesh with a different material um yeah that's gonna be a problem you still, I, I would still deduplicate it because it's the same mesh. Uh, so it should be an extra step where you check, okay, we deduplicate the mesh, but we have to make sure to keep the materials assigned uh, to the right material assigned to the to, to the right surface. So so that should be an extra step uh, step when you are deduplicating. Okay, it's the same mesh, but please do do this and that. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. The yeah, yeah, it is, it's easy to. So let me just repeat it for uh, the recording. So you said it could be done. It could be done. Yes, 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 yes. A couple more lines of code. Yeah. All right. Okay, and that marks the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>